Welcome to NephroTube Online Nephrology Lectures, lectures about management of chronic kidney disease. This is a part two lecture about anemia management. In first lecture, we discussed erythropoietin stimulating agent uh, lecture. And now we will discuss non epo management for anemia in chronic kidney disease. All videos are recorded and uploaded on our uh, YouTube channel. You can subscribe to, to it. And all PowerPoints are available at nefretube.com. And also in the description below each video on nefretube, you will find a link uh, to the PowerPoint of the lecture and Facebook group for daily MCQs and uh, cases. We discussed uh, regarding CKD till now, definition, classification, causes, and diagnosis, pathogenesis, progression, and complications of CKD. And we discussed in uh, the previous webinar, uh, anemia management in CKD, erythropoietin stimulating agents, and now we will discuss non-EPO management of chronic kidney disease. My talk outline, I will talk or start by the most important uh, non-EPO management according to the available evidence. The strong evidence goes for iron therapy. The weak evidence for the adjuvant therapies. And I will talk in short about dialysis and its effect on anemia, diet, and finally emerging therapies, especially hypoxic inducible factors. Starting by anemia, starting sorry by iron therapy, is iron important for management of anemia in CKD? Yes. And sometimes it may be enough to start by iron, star, iron therapy for a while without starting erythropoietin stimulating agents in some patients. In three trials, the placebo arm received iron therapy, which maintained hemoglobin within target. Yes, some of the ARM uh, patients uh, had a drop in hemoglobin and received a rescue course of darbiputin, but they maintained the hemoglobin for a long period only on iron without the need of erythropoietin stimulating agents. That's why the suggestion or recommendation is to start with iron, uh, with iron therapy and follow up hemoglobin. If it is enough to maintain hemoglobin, so maintain the patient only on iron. If it is not enough, you can add erythropoietin stimulating agents. So, as I said, this group was on iron replacement therapy in comparison with, with the other arm receiving their PPT now. Okay, how to monitor iron status of in our patients? Multiple investigations are available for monitoring iron therapy. The most famous are ferritin transferrin saturation. And also, there are the percentage hypochromic red blood cells and reticulocytic hemoglobin content, which are not available in our countries. But mainly, ferritin and TSAT are used in the daily practice of most nephrologists to monitor iron status of the patient. Here in Egypt, the tricyclic hemoglobin content is available, and sometimes we order it according uh, the policies of the hospitals. Okay, what about, about KDU guidelines about the use of iron to treat anemia in CKD? They mention that you have for adult CKD patients with anemia, not on iron or as a therapy, they suggest a trial or of IV iron or if the patient is not on dialysis, you can try oral iron therapy for one to three months. When? When to start iron therapy, whatever it is, intravenous iron or oral iron, when to start? They suggest to start if the transferrin saturation is below or equal 30% and ferritin is below or equal 500. So what is the target? They mentioned here, when to start, but what is the target? When I have to stop iron therapy, I will mention it now. But in general, they suggested to start if transferring saturation is below or equal 30%, and if ferritin is below or equal 500 nanograms per minute. 
As mentioned in Kidi Yoga, in, in Oxford, handle of nephrology and hypertension, the targets are if the patient is not if the patient is on hemodialysis, you have to start or you need to maintain ferritin more than 200. And if the patient is not on dialysis, it's important to maintain ferritin more than 100. Generally, it's recommended to be between 200 and 500. This is near what Kidigo mentioned. They mentioned to start if the ferritin is below than 500, he said below than 30%. And they mentioned, and also Kidigo mentioned, to avoid iron if ferritin is more than 800. Regarding TSET, they recommended that the target must be more than 20% and the aim to 20 to 40. It is near to what was mentioned by Kidigo. The hypochromic red blood cells must be less than 6% and the toxicity chemical content, if are available, must be more than 29 picogram per cell. What is the frequency to measure iron status by ferritin or transferrin saturation or other markers, measure iron stores one to three monthly, depending on the clinical situations. But this cannot be standardized for patients on hemodialysis or not on hemodialysis, as, as I will mention now, as suggested by Kidigo. Kidigo mentioned, if you are using, if you are on dialysis and you, it's better to use intravenous iron, if a patient is not on dialysis, it's better to give a chance for oral iron therapy for one to three months. If the patient is not on dialysis, when to give the patient intravenous iron? This depends on the clinical scenario of the patient. As we said in the previous lecture, the most important term in the management of anemia in CKD is individualization. You can use or select the root of iron administration intravenous versus oral, especially in non-dialysis patients, according to the severity of iron deficiency, response to the previous oral iron therapy, and side effects with either oral therapy as GIT discomfort or intravenous therapy as reaction and anaphylaxis, and finally, according to patient compliance. If you will use oral iron supplements, you have to know that the patient must receive at least 200 milligram elemental iron per day. So you have to know the elemental iron content of each type of available iron in your market. Because the dose of the drug doesn't mention its elemental iron content. Regarding ferrous sulfate, only 22, 32% of the iron considered elemental. Ferrous gluconate, only 12%. Fumarate, only 33%. And so on. So you have to know well the elemental iron of the drug you are prescribing to your patient because if you use oral iron to test it for one to three months, the patient must receive daily about 200 milligram elemental iron. What about available preparation of intravenous iron? The first and the safest is iron sacrose. Iron sacrose has low incidence of anaphylaxis and adverse reactions, so test those not necessarily. Usually we use it in hemodialysis patients as first as a loading dose of about one ampoule, 100 milligram, for 10 dialysis sessions, so the patient will receive 1,000 milligram, one gram of iron, and continue iron weekly if ferritin is still below than 500. If ferritin is more than 500, you can use it bi-weekly or monthly according to, to the response of the patient. If you will use iron sacrose for patients who are not in hemodialysis, usually due to a failure of the oral iron to maintain the iron status of the patient, or if the patient is on peritoneal dialysis, you can use 200 milligram every one to three months. If there is urgency and you need loading the patient with iron, you can use 200 milligram weekly for three doses, then maintain the patient on 200 milligram every one to three months. 
to give a loading dose, but less than what is used in Hemodialysis. Ferric gluconate is available in some countries, and it is also safe. Anaphylaxis is rare. And finally, iodic strain, which is usually available in most countries, but it carries higher risk for reaction and anaphylaxis. And this dose is mandatory before using, using these drugs. I want to mention one important protocol for the management of our deficiency using intravenous iron, which is the total dose infusion or single dose intravenous iron. Multiple calculators are available on the internet to calculate the total deficiency of iron in your patient. Then you can give all this deficiency in one session, which is usually for five to six hours of iron infusion. Multiple protocols are available because this very risky the patient may uh, develop anaphylaxis or reaction or whatever. And you have to uh, follow up his blood pressure, heart rate, uh, every half an hour at first, then every one hour. This is maybe important protocol for patients who have difficulty in mobility and also they are not responding to oral iron so they can be admitted in a hospital for one day to give the total iron deficiency in one day. But there is a maximum uh, dose for infusion of iron. You can't infuse it more than 20 milligram per kilogram for one day if the patient needs a dose more than 20 milligram per kilogram of iron so you have to divide the total dose infusion on two days with one week difference between them we have an important uh, issue and bad issue regarding serum ferritin and transferrin saturation for monitoring of iron because serum ferritin and transferrin saturation, especially serum ferritin, is acute phase reactant, and it may be increased in inflammatory states and other conditions. So, and it is very common to find your hemodialysis patients with high ferritin level, and he may be iron deficient. But ferritin is high because the continuous inflammatory state that the patient may be present, hemodialysis patient may be, or CKD patient may be predisposed to. So what is the solution? How I can monitor iron if there is a doubt that serum ferritin is not accurate in my patient? Before I say what are the solutions, because of this point that serum iron, sorry, serum ferritin is not accurate, we have two definitions, important definitions, the functional iron deficiency, and inflammation-related iron deficiency. Before going through that, I have to talk about the hepcidin. Hepcidin is an inflammatory marker produced by liver in cases of inflammation. If there is inflammation, it will stimulate hepcidin, and the hepcidin itself will block all iron stores from releasing their iron into the circulation. They will block duodenal enterocytes, they will block splenic macrophages, and even they will block hepatocytes and calfar cells themselves, which will lead to decreased plasma iron in these patients with high ferritin level. So if there is inflammation, there will be release in hepcidin that will block the release of iron from iron stores, which will cause high ferritin level, but it will cause low plasma level and low transferrin saturation level. And so we have two definitions, functional iron deficiency and reticular endothelial inflammatory block. I, we talked now about this one, the reticular endothelial inflammatory block, where there is infection or inflammation, hepcidin is released, iron is trapped in the reticular endothelial cells and not released in the circulation. You will find this patient high CRP due to infection, high ferritin, and finally, low transferrin saturation. That's why ferritin is not a good marker in some situations for the iron stores or for the iron homeostasis in, your, in our body. What, are, what is functional iron deficiency? In functional iron deficiency, 
you will also find normal or raised ferritin and low T T set, which is some for somehow is it looks like the inflammatory block. Raised ferritin with low T set, but the etiology is different. Functional iron deficiency is secondary to the use of erythropoietin stimulating agents. You are using erythropoietin stimulating agents which give a supraphysiological rate of erythropoiesis, which outpaced the delivery of iron by transferrin. The action of erythropoiesis is more than the delivered iron. So you will find low transferrin saturation with high ferritin. The management of this is iron replacement, while the management of this is the management of the infection itself. But Actually, it is very difficult to differentiate between both of them. And this clinical scenario is very bad. OK, what if I am in doubt about the ferritin level? And I want to be sure about the iron status of the patient. Is ferritin is high because of it is an acute phase reactant, as in infection, ferritin will be raised because of it is an acute phase reactant, or ferritin is high because the patient already have iron stores. Actually, if it is acute phase reactant, usually you will find transferrin saturation is low. But if you want to be more sure, you can use other markers as reticulocytic hemoglobin content and percentage of hypochromic cells. And the, I use in my practice the tickly hemoglobin content, and actually it is very accurate to uh, make me know the iron store in this patient. We need it to be more than 29 or 30 picogram. So if the patient has a high CHR, more than 20 or 30 picogram, so the patient iron stores is repleted. If it is low, even if the ferritin is high, the patient is iron deficient. So we need percent hypochromic red blood cell to be more than 6% and CHR to be less than 29 picogram. Is iron safe a way of anaphylaxis? No. High intravenous iron dose is related to mortality and hospitalization risk. In this study, they found that if average monthly intravenous dose is more than 300 milligram per month, the hospitalization risk was elevated. And also, regarding cardiovascular mortality, non-cardiovascular and non-infection-related mortality and infection-related mortality is high in patients with high dose intravenous iron more than 300 milligram per month. So after initiation, it's better to maintain the patient. After loading a dose of iron, it's better to maintain the patient on the lowest iron intravenous, intravenous iron doses per month, which maintain his iron stores and hemoglobin. That's why also, the EU guideline mentioned that you have to avoid iron use in active systemic infections because it will uh, exaggerate and exacerbate the infection. Two important updates regarding iron use in CKT patients. The first is the availability now of ferricitrate, which is iron containing phosphate binder. It has a dual action as a phosphate binder, decrease the serum phosphate level and supplementing the patient with iron enough to raise his iron level. Also, one of the most important updates is as I said here, as I mentioned here, the ferricitrate rate increases total iron. Another important point regarding the uh, iron therapy in security patients is the availability in some countries of ferric pyrophosphate citrate in the dialysate, in the hemodialysis. Ferric pyrophosphate citrate. This makes iron product to be administered to patients on hemodialysis via dialysate. Now, what Regard what, uh, what about the adjuvant 
Therabiz. I will give a summary about the adjuvant therapies without uh, mentioning the studies and the evidence. But you will find the details of the studies and the evidence in the PowerPoint on nephotube.com. The link is below this video in the description. In summary, KEDU guidelines not recommend or suggest the using of androgen and the other adjuvants regarding, uh, including vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, folic acid, l carnitine and ventoxifelin for management of anemia. This is a summary, this table is the summary of the available evidence regarding these adjuvant threats. You will find the details of this uh, evidence on the uh, nephotube.com. The lecture will be uploaded in, uh, is uploaded on nephotube.com. The link is below this video. Regarding vitamin C, there are some positive data and results regarding its benefit in management of anemia, especially resistant anemia, but the studies are on very small sample of population. Regarding vitamin D, B12, B6, and folate, there is no benefit on them except if they are deficient. Regarding vitamin E, no clear data to be used in anemia. Regarding l carnitine and ventoxifelin, there are contra contradictory data, positive and negative results, also on a small sample of patients. And regarding androgen, all reports mentioned the many side effects of androgen which are hazardous. And the risk may be more than the benefit if they are used in the management of anemia. So adjuvant therapies to use or not to use. This is a self-opinion based on the available evidence. If the patient has, has a hyporesponsiveness and the patient is resistant to all lines of management, and you excluded all other causes of ESA resistance, as, I, as we mentioned in last lecture, you may try vitamin C. Don't use androgen. It is important to exclude and correct other causes before using vitamin C, and use vitamin C only for short duration for about three months, according to the available evidence, to avoid oxalosis. If you need to make a randomized control trial for is a hyperresponsiveness, so try any of the adjuvant therapies, but it's better to exclude androgen. And finally, any of these medications can be used in evidence of deficiency of any of them. Or they can be used for management, if they are approved for management in any other disease than treating anemia. Okay, regarding other therapies, 2D, dialysis and diet. Regarding dialysis, first point is the adequacy of dialysis. Adequacy of dialysis reduce the dose of ESA, to re reduce the dose of retropotent stimulating agent. Here is a comparison between a KTV, KT over V less than 1.2, and KT over V more than 1.4. With higher KT over V, you will find reduction in the dose of recombinant erythropoietin. But there is another study compared KT over V more than or equal 1.33. There was no further effect on epotene responsiveness, more than 1.33. So you may need to elevate your KT over V, but within the recommended target or range. No need to make it more than 1.4, 1.5. It's enough to make it within the recommended target of uh, dialysis. This is regarding adequacy. What, are, what about frequency? With the FNH trials, regarding daily trial and nocturnal trial, in daily trial, patients dialyze three times per week, conventional hemodialysis were compared by six daily dialysis per week, six days of dialysis. And also the nocturnal, two arms, one arm with three times per week dialysis and the other arm with more frequent dialysis six times per week. 
Regarding the ESA dose, there was no difference, statistical significant difference between the two groups who were dialyzed for three times or six times. Also here, there was no difference in the nocturnal trial regarding three times and six times. Also regarding hemoglobin level, there was no significant difference between these two arms, although the hemoglobin was higher in the six daily dialysis group, but patients with three times dialysis have hemoglobin within the recommended target. And also in the nocturnal trial, there was no difference between the two arms. So frequent hemodialysis will not reduce either dose and will not raise or have a benefit or has a benefit regarding hemoglobin level. More frequent hemodialysis didn't have a significant or clinically important effect on anemia management. The third point regarding dialysis, we mentioned the first point adequacy, second point frequency, and third point is the use of ultra-pure dialysate. Ultra-pure dialysate, yes, it causes a change and reduction in erythropoietin dose as a unit per week, and also mean it causes a change in C-reactive protein and other inflammatory markers and mediators. Regarding diet, I will not go in depth in diet, but I have to mention that. Malnutrition, inflammation causing causes resistance for erythropoietin stimulating agents, and many available sources of heme or non-heme iron are available. And it is important for the dietitian and nutritionist to give your patient enough diet, which containing enough iron, which may help to some extent maintaining iron level of the patient. Finally, what about emergent therapies? The most important is, is the hypoxic inducible factor, and I will mention others in short. What is hypoxic inducible factor, and what, uh, what are hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers, and what are the main ideas? Hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers, the main idea, number one, they have an epidependent effect. What is this? Let's talk in a normal uh, person. In a normal person under hypoxia, the hypoxic inducible factor will be translocated into the nucleus of the erythropoietin releasing cells and, sorry, and it will be demineralized. There will be demineralization and the trans uh, transcription with the release of erythropoietin to correct hypoxia, which is under normal, in normal person under hypoxia. The hypoxic inducible factor effect in the nucleus will cause increased erythropoietin, increased aporeceptors, and the others that I mentioned now. The effect of hypoxic inducible factor is not only related to erythropoietin, related to others that I will mention now, but in general, we have to know that if hypoxic inducible factor is translocated into the nucleus, it will cause increased erythropoietin release and increased aporeceptor. So it is logic in our patients, if we can maintain hypoxic inducible factor, even if norm, in normal oxygen tension, Let's go through again what is happening normally in normal person. As I said, in uh, uh, as I said, under hypoxia, hypoxic and dispersed factor is translocated, and finally cause erythropoietin release. In normoxia, normal oxygen, hypoxic and dispersed factor is distracted by furolyl hydroxylase enzyme. Furolyl hydroxylase enzyme. So under normoxia. Hypoxic inducible factor degradation by prolyl hydroxylase enzyme. So, if it is available to prevent prolyl hydroxylase enzyme in our CKD patients, this will maintain high level of hypoxic inducible factor even in normoxin, which will, will be translocated and cause erythropoietin release. And this is the site of action or the idea of hypoxic inducible factor. Hypoxic inducible factors stabilizers, sorry, the idea of hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers 
is to stabilize hypoxic and T-cell fat. They are propyl hydroxylase enzyme inhibitors. So maintain the level of hypoxic and T-cell factor and maintain erythropoiesis and maintain erythropoietin and hemoglobin level. This picture shows this is kidney under physiological non-stipulated conditions when there is no hypoxia and there is this is effect. You can see the EPO pool increased under the action of hypoxic inducible factor. Hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers, as I mentioned now, raise the hemoglobin level by raising erythropoietin release. But hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers has, have another mechanism of actions to maintain hemoglobin rather than stimulation of erythropoietin release. One of them, and one of the most important of them, is TIF stabilizers affect RNA metabolism. TIF stabilizers affect iron reabsorption, iron transformation, transport, and redistribution. It increases, it increases iron metabolism. So they have a benefit over the traditional as a therapy, the traditional erythropoietin stimulating agents. They not only affect the erythropoietin level or increase the erythropoietin level, they also increase iron level and metabolism. Hypoxic inducible factor upregulates transferrin receptors on erythroplasts and increase uptake of iron by erythroplasts. So hypoxic inducible factor till now, hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers till now has two have two mechanisms of action related to erythropoietin release, related to RNA metabolism. And the third related change to HIF stabilizer is effect on HEPs. They found that hypoxic inducible factor stabilizers cause reduction in serum HEPs levels with unknown mechanism, whether this is a direct or indirect effect, they don't know, but they found that hepcidin level, which may cause block of the uh, iron stores, also release the second two HIF stabilizers. So HIF stabilizers have many advantages over erythropoietin agents. They induce EPO release, they increase iron, and they decrease hepcidin. And the more important that they are already administered. All of these are advantages of HIF stabilizers over ESA. But the black side of HIF stabilizers that they may increase angiogenesis, cell cycle, and cell growth, which may induce malignancy. And this under research till now. But one of its pitfalls that it affects cell growth and angiogenesis. Different HIF stabilizers are available under studies and some of them are available in some countries in the market. The most important of them is the Roxadustat. Uh, These are the different HIF stabilizers available. They're half-life and dosing. You will find uh, uh, Roxadustat. Half-life is 12 hours. So it can be taken only three times per week. These drugs are available now in some countries. And many studies are available in them and the large and dramatic control trials. And they had been tested in both patients on dialysis and not on dialysis. This article in New England Journal of Medicine, the Chinese population, they tested the uh, roxadustat in patients undergoing long-term dialysis and also they were tested in patients not receiving dialysis and the results were positive. There are other emerging therapies, many emerging therapies, some of them targeting hepcidin itself and others, but all uh, the studies still experimental, even uh, there is no uh, available drugs on, of these in the market. 
The most powerful emerging therapy available now is the hypoxic induced refractive stabilizers. So these drugs are still experimental till now. Also, other many drugs are available, not directly targeting EPO receptors or targeting EPO receptors. Many drugs are under experiment experiments till now. So my home messages. Iron is a coronary storm management, coronary storm in management of renal anemia. Alternate iron assessment markers can be used if infection is suspicious, as the reticulocytic hemoglobin content. Adjuvant therapies, evidence is very weak. As a hyperresponsiveness, you can use vitamin C after exclusion of other causes. You can make randomized controlled trials for these drugs. You can use them if there is deficiency or treating other disease rather than any. Our dialysis adequacy within limits gives better as a response. No benefit for delay and daily and nocturnal dialysis regarding enhancing the response. Ultra pure, pure dialysis equal better as a response. And diet is a cornerstone of anemia management. Emergent therapies are available. The most promising is hypoxic and disable factor stabilizers. And thank you. See you in the next lecture on Nephrotube and bye-bye.